In today's episode, we're exploring Intarsia. No, it's not a sushi restaurant. We're visiting a craftsman who makes three-dimensional wooden pictures like this. Stay tuned to see how this was made. Welcome to Handmade, a series about artisans and craftsmen who use their creativity and skills to make unique works of art. In our modern world, it seems like everything is mass-produced, pre-packaged, and available on Amazon. So it's easy to forget that some things are still made by hand. So come on, let's go visit the studio of today's featured artisan. Intarsia uses a variety of shapes, sizes, and species of wood that are shaped together to create a mosaic-like picture with the illusion of depth. I wanted to do something that was dimensional. I like to, to create, and I like to, I like, it's just fun seeing something come together. I didn't touch woodworking until I retired, and I was surprised how fast you know, I, I picked it up. When you finished your career in civil engineering, you told me you wanted to try something new. Why did you pick Intarsia? Well, I wanted to do something that was dimensional. Around our house, you'll see pieces like a steamboat that's three-dimensional. And I always said, I want to do something like that. So then I began exploring, well, what could that be? And, I, you know, you get on the Internet and you look, and I think it's actually my wife that, that found it, but she said, look at this, and it was Intarsia. So uh, I thought, yeah, I, I might do that. I like to draw, I like to sketch. You ended up taking a class from uh, Judy Gale Roberts, who is a, a world-renowned uh, artisan and instructor, and she's here in Tennessee. She is. She's just outside of uh, uh, Sevierville. And I actually went there uh, when I decided I wanted to do this, and her husband was there, and he gave me a tour of the shop, and he showed me the kind of equipment I might need, and. Uh, so I made my list and then ordered my scroll saw, which was a five-month delivery, and patiently waited, and then I started sawing wood. One of the projects that you started to learn how to use your scroll saw were these uh, portraits. Tell me a little bit about how they're made. I wanted to practice with a scroll saw. So that portrait's very forgiving when you're cut outside the line. <laughs> so I started with the, basically what you do, and my daughter-in-law actually took a photograph, right. and I convert it to black and white. Again, there's a computer program for everything. Sure. And then you pixelate it, and then you go in and you take a marker and you start to make sure you don't have any islands where the wood will fall off. So after two or three tries at that, then I took it to the scroll saw, and uh, Basically, you just cut the pattern out, huh? When you're done, you put it on your backboard and you frame it. This is one of your early Intarsia uh, projects. Tell me about how you made this one. I liked it for the, the colors that were in it. And uh, so, you know, you get on, you shop for a pattern. My wife picked that one out because she wanted it to hang in her kitchen. Sure. So I, then you go, you select your woods. Right. I typically go to Jeffrey's in Sevierville again. And uh, this is Purple Heart. It's not so purple now. One of the things I've learned, early piece, is there's no UV protector on there, so the purple's faded, just getting more brownish. The Yellow Heart, it was really bright yellow when it started, and it's faded too, because again, I didn't put a UV protector on that thing. Uh, that is uh, Holly, which is a white wood. Uh, and the birds are cedar, and that's a soft wood, because one of the things you learn when you cut projects, because um, you're using a very thin blade on your, on your scroll saw, is hardwoods are hard to keep in the line. Right. And you break a lot of blades yeah. and it wants to drift a little bit. And when I do my animals, you'll see it in some of my other ones like the deer and the elk or whatever, I usually like to use cedar because it's soft and I can stay in the lines much better with it. Again, you build your, you know, you cut out your pieces of your pattern, you take it through your sanders and you shape and you shape and then you use hand sanders and eventually you get it the way you like it, and then you put the polyurethane coating on it, and uh, you, you've got a project. A beautiful piece. What are some of your favorite subjects, and what inspires you about them? Grew up in West Virginia, but I spent my adult life in Louisiana and Texas. We always love coming up here to the mountains and the lakes, and uh, I just love the Smokies. That's, hence, we're here, yeah. right? 
And so now I like to do pieces that are from things around here. For instance, cantilever barns and, and elk and deer. So those are typically the subject matter I enjoy most. You obviously spend a lot of time doing this. What do you like about it so much? You know, and I've heard other woodworkers say this, but when I come down to my shop, you know, I look at my watch and go, it's, it's 8 o'clock. And then all of a sudden I look at my watch and it's 1 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the time go? I just, I just, I like to, to create and I like to, I, it's just fun seeing something come together. And I, I just, it's a relaxing hobby. I just I enjoy it. Uh, what words of wisdom do you have to somebody who would like to try their hand at Antarsia? Jump in and, and, and try it. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing what you can do. I mean, uh, I didn't touch woodworking until I retired. I was surprised how fast, you know, I, you know I, I picked it up. But again, too, I took a class, and there's woodworkers around the village, and you ask questions, and, and people teach you things, and... And the, uh, I guess the most sage wisdom I always hear from the woodpeckers meetings is you're always going to see defects or things you don't like in your work, but no one else sees it. That's right. So I believe that. People say they like it, and I don't know if they're really thinking, oh, I don't know, but I'm assuming that they don't see that line that didn't quite match up the way I wanted it to. <laughs> yeah. That's a very common concern with artists. Let's head over to your workbench, and you can show me actually how Intarsi is made. Okay, great. Great. Show me some of the steps on how it goes together. All right, well, the first thing you want to do is you want to pick a pattern. Right. And there's different places uh, to go to do that. There's online, right. uh, different people sell patterns. Uh, I get a scroll saw magazine, there's patterns in there. And then you can create your own, which is something I'm getting more and more into as I go. So, again, you pick your pattern, and I've got one here. This is actually going to be a set of three different flowers. You then cut out your patterns. And what you want to do is put a sticking material on back, and I've got a machine that does that. You take this, and I'll just for uh, example show you. You look and say, okay, I want to get that pattern just so, because I want the wood grain to flow with the direction of this leaf. So then you place that on your, uh, on your wood. You also want to select your woods. You've got uh, purple heart, yellow heart, cedar, poplar, and Poplar is really fascinating because it comes in different shades of green. So you put those all together and say, yeah, I think that matches, that blends well. Because in pure intarsia, you don't paint. So it's very important to pick the right color wood as well as the grain of the wood. That's right. And, and I do like the, the rich color. Yeah, that is a beautiful color. So now I've got all my wood. I've, I've gone over to my bandsaw, made my initial cuts, take it over the scroll saw, cut the pattern, and then once I've got the pieces cut out, they come over here, and you start fitting it together, and of course I've already bumped this one, it's not glued down, but you start cutting your pieces and seeing that everything fits up, everything is, is in alignment, and right. where it doesn't, you take the piece out, put it in your scrap box, and you're <laughs> Start again. Start again. Here's a, here's a, a leaf, and it, on back here you see a shim that I put on to have it kind of raise up from the piece, and then I've done a back cut on the back so it looks like it's floating in space, so to speak. But you do all that, and this is with a file. You file out your, your uh, veins on your leaf. You do some sanding, and this one still needs uh, some more sanding. You I usually start with 150 grit, and I go all the way down to sometimes 340, depending. So you get all your sanding done. And some of it is done by hand. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a coward. Okay. So, so I'll do the the... the rough sanding on the sanders in my shop sure and when I get close to where it's going to have to line up with another piece I go to the hand sanders and I sand and I sand and I check and I sand and I check so once you've gone too far then the piece then in, the piece doesn't fit anywhere again. so again you got all you get all your pieces made and I'm gonna hold on to this one you get all your pieces made you got it all fit up you're you're happy with it so then the next step is you put on the polyurethane finish. And what I love most when I'm doing it is here's before and here's after. Right. And I just love putting the polyurethane on and watch the wood grain pop out. Sure. Because it just, it's just, that part's magical. 
12 hours, first coat, six hours, second coat, six hours, third coat, and then a UV protector, which I'm now using so my wood doesn't fade. It doesn't fade. And then the nervous part that I talked about earlier is the glue up. Because you start gluing and it all fit once. <laughs> and this is a uh, holly, poplar, and purple heart. So not this piece, not too complicated, but uh, uh, I like the looks of it. So my wife has a place to hang it, I think. So here's one of your uh, larger pieces. It, by the way, it's gorgeous. Thank you. How did you take the base pattern and, and personalize it to you? Well, on this one, again, I like to make it my own. And the more I do this, the more I want to make my own. So the first thing I did was on the original pattern, this was just one kind of solid piece. So I made panels. Yeah. And one of the things you learn when you do woodwork is you have kerf where you're removing wood. I put all that together and I had a big gap here. And I said, well, you know, that really needs a shadow. So I added that yeah, little there you go. piece. And then I said, well, let me add a horse. So I added the horse to the pattern. I added another door because uh, I just thought it needed something else there. I added the door handle. Do it very slow and four or five times because it breaks the first four times. And then I added the barrel, the pitchfork. And I think uh, in this particular pattern, I modified the cloud over here. So... Uh, those are the pieces that I chose to, to add or modify. When you're making intarsia, what's the hardest skill uh, to master? Getting the, the flow right, like the leaves, for instance. Uh, when you do those, typically you take a pencil and you, you'll draw the shape on, on, on the wood that you want. And, and it's kind of counterintuitive because you're taking wood off, so it's kind of a negative image in right. a way, right? So, and that was one of the first mistakes I made. I cut one end high and the other end low and I had it reversed. So, whoops, that's not gonna work. But uh, over time, you just get, you know, you get better. The more you do, the better you get, so. And you've only been doing this for how long? About two and a half years. <laughs> that, that's amazing that you've gotten to the point that your skills have improved where you're taking base patterns, modifying them, making your own, uh, decisions and it's really something. Here's another one of your really beautiful pieces. Again, tell me how you uh, modify the pattern to fit your personality. Okay. Well, first of all, you may recognize this barn. That's a cantilever barn that's in Cades Cove. There's only about 316 of these in the country. I took a photograph and I have a, a, a video projector, so I traced that on tracing paper and then cut my patterns from that and then I took patterns again from Judy Gale Roberts uh, that the elk are patterns that, that she created and the barns a pattern I mean the wagon is one that she created uh, so I blended those in I added fence and green for the fields and again a plow I got this off of Pinterest I just would look sure uh, and again you just trace it and, and cut it uh, and again, this one's got a barrel, and then the tree, same thing. I, there's lots of places you can go. Uh, interesting, then go to comic books or yeah. coloring books. Yes. And take those, yes. and then trace trace those, because this is actually barn wood. Right. Because a lot of the patterns I see, they actually use wood burners to make the panels. And I'm looking at, I'm going, well, you know, that looks like wood panel. Right. Just take an actual barn wood. And it's pretty cool because it's from some old barn somewhere in Tennessee. What kind of wood's this? Greg, this is black palm. Some of them uh, are from South America, typically, oh, okay. the col more colorful ones. This in particular is uh, lignum vitaea, and it's hard to find. I, I got this board, and I didn't know what I was sitting on until I ran out, because I can't find it you can't anymore. find it anymore. But it comes from South America. Yeah. Uh, the yellow heart, I believe, comes from South America. Uh, and, and those do cost a little bit more, but again, it gives you color without actually painting. The detail on this hay, you uh, showed me the, the Wonder Wheel, which is a specialty grinding. Yes. Because you can use a Dremel sometimes. You can use a Dremel. Uh, if you don't have to be accurate, then the, the, the Wonder Wheel, you just take your piece and run it across the wheel. Right. And like when I did, did a bear to make the hair, I used the Wonder Wheel. And again, you don't have to precisely follow a line. Do you ever feel limited by just having to use wood? You know, when you're dealing with contrast and shadow, 
uh, you have to really think about how that's going to look. Right. Because you, it's hard. You can't do a a fading or, or something that's blending in, right? right? It's two different pieces of wood. So that you have to think about a bit. I'm working on one now uh, where that's becoming the struggle is how to blend it all together. What's your favorite part of the whole process? My favorite part is, again, when you put the polyurethane on the, on the piece, that's what I use is polyurethane, and the grain pops out. I just it's it just it's like magic for me this particular piece I cut this one and I thought it fit and I was so happy with myself and then I was gluing it up I'm gluing it up I'm gluing it up and I get over here and I've got a gap I'm going oh my goodness I can't cut all that again so I ad-libbed and then I created grass right here <laughs> and that's covering a big kerf gap <laughs> so those are things you do huh Well, thank you for inviting us into your studio. You're, you're, an, you're an absolutely amazing artist, and this is a very challenging art form. So, uh, it, like I said, your work is amazing. Well, thank you, and I appreciate you coming. Now that you've seen a craftsman at work, I hope you have a greater appreciation of the time and skill that it takes to make something by hand. It takes passion, practice, and time. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I'll see you next time on Handmade.